Today's reading is from Rays of the One Light, weekly commentaries on the Bible and the Bhagavad Gita by Swami Kriyananda. This week's reading, Can Man See God? Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. There is a saying in chapter 1 of the Gospel of St. John that would seem to respond with a definite no to the question, Can man see God? The saying is, No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Many great saints, however, claim to have seen God. If we ask then, can God be seen rather than can man see God, the answer is yes. Else those saints lied and the scriptures themselves lied. For Jesus also said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The point is, it is not man, this human body, these human eyes, that sees God. God can be seen only with spiritual vision, with the eye of the soul. As the Bhagavad Gita puts it in the 11th chapter, Thou canst not see me with mortal eyes, therefore I now give thee divine sight. Behold my supreme power of yoga. With these words, Hari, the exalted Lord of Yoga, revealed himself to Arjuna in his infinite form. Paramahansa Yogananda, in Autobiography of a Yogi, describes the supernal experience in words more readily comprehensible to modern minds than the poetic phraseology of the Bhagavad Gita. In the chapter, An Experience in Cosmic Consciousness, the chapter in Experience in Cosmic Consciousness is one of the most inspiringly beautiful in all mystical literature. Here is a brief excerpt. An oceanic joy broke upon calm, endless shores of my soul. The Spirit of God, I realized, is exhaustless bliss. His body is countless tissues of light. I saw the divine dispersion of rays pour from an eternal source, blazing into galaxies, transfigured with ineffable auras. Again and again I saw the creative beams condense into constellations, then resolve into sheets of transparent flame. By rhythmic reversion, sextillion words, worlds passed into diaphanous luster Fire became firmament. I cognized the center of the Empyrean as a point of intuitive perception in my heart. Irradiating splendor issued from my nucleus to every part of the universal structure. The creative voice of God I heard resounding as Om, the vibration of the cosmic motor. This, so the great masters of Ur, is what God is, and this also, they insist, is what we are in our deepest reality. Thus, through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Om, Om, Om. Now it's my turn. I live with a very wonderful storyteller, Carol Vartu. And the stories that she brings me these days are stories from um, the children for whom she is the nanny two days a week. And this past whoa, I don't need this. And this past week, she told me the story of the children, their age three and age five and a half, I think were being, as she says, very squirrely, which means they were at each other and um, building momentum and really on each other's case and eventually probably hitting and 
screaming and running around. And so she wanted to cool them down. And so, bless her heart, she started saying, fill this world with peace and harmony. Lord, fill this world with peace and harmony. Lord, fill this world with peace and harmony. And the children just went silent. And the little guy, Raymond, put his hands together and said, God, I just have the most wonderful sister ever. <laughs> and, she, and she is this and she is that. And he went on and on and on. And Alice, who's very spunky, goes, what is he doing? <laughs> and Carol said, he's talking to God. And the little girl said, well, I want to see him. Just like that. And Carol, in her wisdom, said, that will come. Wonderful. And then the children went on to a calm and peaceful day. So that desire is in all of us. We want to see the God to whom we pray. We want to feel the God to whom we feel in our hearts. We want to know. And as Yogananda said, the time for knowing God has come. Thinking about these children's response took me back, of course, to those wonderful children's letters to God. And I think they're so appropriate to share a few also this morning. Because children really are pure in heart. Um, and, and that's what we're asked to become. That's, that's the burden we need to lay down, is all those Andrew, help. Use this one. This one. OK. So, yeah, so we want to let the heart open and the winds of Om blow through and let go of all the ways in which the world has grabbed out and caught us. And children so often have an innate direct contact with God. And their prayers are conversations, which is really the essence of prayer. It's a back and forth kind of thing. So there was a child who wrote to God and said, how did you know you were God? <laughs> Very profound question, actually. It'd be a nice meditation to meditate on that. Another one wrote, do the animals use you, or is there someone else for them? <laughs> and then another feisty little boy wrote, do you really mean do unto others as they do unto you? Because if you did, I'm going to fix my brother. <laughs> and then finally, did you mean for the giraffe to look like that? Or was it a mistake? <laughs> and I love that. I love that quality in children, which I've been listening to a man who's very, very keen on bringing creativity and the arts back into the schools. And he, he firmly believes that the creativity issue is as important as literacy and that that's going to be our next step in education. And so um, this willingness to make a mistake, and then, of course, thinking that maybe God makes some mistakes, too. I think we think that sometimes when some karma is coming toward us, but it's not so. So we need to prepare ourselves to receive spiritual sight. There's a lot of preparedness, and, and this is what the spiritual path is all about. It's, it's about n not learning, but unlearning. It's about coming back to our pure and childlike state in relation to God. And there was a wonderful story. Um, I think this took place in the 30s. Um, it take, tells of a man who was in a, an office where there was um, a job 
to be found. And the office was filled with so many people seeking that one job. And they were all very they were full of conversation and talking and lots of noise going on in that office. But this man sat very, very quietly waiting for the call. And the man who was asking for these applicants punched out in his office the Morse code, which said, if you can hear this message, come in to the office and take the job. This man sitting quietly was the only one who heard that. And he walked in and took the job because his employer knew what kind of a fellow he was and what kind of an employee he would be. I love that story. That's important to, to remember. So how do we prepare and what are we actually preparing for? We're preparing for what we are always preparing for, which is to be lifted into that sense of who we are beyond the confines of this body. This is a much too small a place for our soul and our consciousness. We want the freedom of going back to where we came from. And that freedom is obtained within ourselves. This is the wonderful thing about being in the human body because we have come to that from being in many other kinds of bodies and experienced everything from an amoeba up to Lajana Beninga. I mean, for everyone, it, it just goes that way. And here we are suddenly. And not only here we are suddenly, but here we are asking the essential questions. And so we have the ability the human being is a special creation, Master said. The search for the evolutionary um, cousin is meh, interesting, but not very fruitful. Because we're a special dispensation from God. Within ourselves, we can see, hear, touch, feel God, the creator. And we are a part of him. And it sure doesn't feel like that some days when we're out here battling with our karma. But it's the truth. And Swamiji very wisely, Swami Kriyananda, who founded Ananda and has now since passed, he very wisely always kept us in balance when we would place too much emphasis on meditation, he would say, remember, it's a balance between work, service, and meditation, service, and meditation. And then I remember the year when he said, you know, there is also a social way to God. That was very interesting. So what was he talking about? There needs to be a way in which we can make this climb up the mountain of consciousness by disciplining our thoughts and attitudes to see the light, God, love within every single individual that we encounter. Why is that so important? Because we're not, Master says, you can't love God if you can't love your fellow human beings. You just don't have the knack somehow. You don't understand what it means because in loving everyone, which is what Swamiji was able to say within the year before he passed, I love everyone. We need to learn to do that. We need to remember that that's one of our major jobs because what that does is put you up against a whole bunch of personalities, and you know we're not just our personalities. So that's just the cover. We, learn, we need to constantly become aware that our job is to push through the cover, to see deeper than the cover, and to love those that we have no particular affinity for. 
So how do we do that? That sounds like really strange. But it's the kind of love we're talking about. It's the love that we feel from God. It's the remembrance that every single individual that you meet each day is as much loved by God as you are. Every single one of them. And if in your consciousness you can shine that awareness onto them, you will be absolutely thrilled what can come back. Because it's the truth of each of us. It's what's deep within each of us is that spirit wanting its freedom. So that's our way, is loving one another and loving all. I have such a great opportunity, and Rashida has joined me in this opportunity, of being at the thrift store and greeting many, many different kinds of people. And I remember someone came in a couple of years ago and said, what are you doing here? They didn't think it was right. We had been talking about art. We had been talking about ministry. They said, what are you doing here? And whoa, I really jumped to it for that one because no, that's not, a, it's not about snobbery. It's not about place. It's not about who you are on the world standards. It's not about any of those things. It's about shining that light so a man came in the other day, and I've figured out a wonderful icebreaker, is to notice the cars that people drive. So they drive right up in front of us. And he had the most unusual car. It was probably gold sort of-ish. You know how the gold cars, they're just not quite really gold. But his was quite old, and wherever he had had a dent or gotten, it gotten into trouble somewhere, he hand-painted it bright gold. So this car was like three quarters bright gold and then, <laughs> then, then that sort of non-gold. And it was fun looking. So I said to him, that's a really fun looking car. And he said, yeah, I'm working on it and someday it'll be complete. And we had a conversation about that. And, and um, when he left, he leaned forward in this sweet kind of really, um, mm, don't know how to get it. It was just a, a lovely sort of slight lean, put out his hand and said, my name's Omar. It was such a sweet moment, such a sweet moment. I said, well, I, I'm, I'm glad you came today, and I hope you come again because I need to keep up on the progress of this gold car. <laughs> but I tell this story because that's all that we're in the business of doing no matter where we do what we do. We're in the business of reflecting what the joy from our meditation, the joy from our friendships, the joy of being alive and being able to share the light. That's what we want to share always with others, no matter where God has placed us. And this social way, combined with meditation is what begins to open the door to that higher perception within. You know, your daily life isn't separate from your meditation and your meditation isn't separate from your daily life. They go together. They work together. And you must become aware of that and, and begin to perceive that so that when you have a day of loving, it will affect your meditation. And your meditation will once again release any of the attachments that you've gotten in there. You know, working at the thrift store, you get attachments. It's really tough. Um, but I worked out a way to deal with that. I, I loan it to myself overnight when I'm coming back the next morning. <laughs> then the little attach, attach, attach can reverse and go, take it back, take it back, take it back, take it back. So, so that works out really well. So how can we see God? We can see God by bringing him close by our devotion and our love. And maybe someday we will be able to break into that experience of cosmic consciousness. And read Master's poem, Samadhi, which gives us a wonderful, that, that the cosmic consciousness chapter in autobiography 
and the Samadhi poem, which I think is in, in autobiography as well. Those will help us to see the goal. Those will help us to understand what we're wanting to get in touch with. And that love, which I know we question sometimes, if it, if it can't be toward a person, if we can't see that, can it be really what we're looking for? And I tell you, it is. I mean, loving God is reciprocal, completely and absolutely reciprocal. It's all that he really wants from us. I think I covered it. I want to just tell a little story of Swamiji. Mm, he was at a conference in Montreal. This was probably, it was probably in the 70s when Stephen Gaskin of the farm, I, do any of you gray hairs remember Stephen Gaskin? Yeah. <laughs> he was a wonderful fellow who was running a cooperative community in the South. He had been an English teacher, which I didn't know that. It was, that's a surprising fact. But he talked, hips, as Swami put it, hipster language. He was he had just thrown over all he knew in, about English literature and English grammar, and he just talked hipster. And Swami said he was so genuine. He was so completely himself. And every time Swami told this story, he, he just sobbed. He said, I loved that man. And so we're on this journey to spirit. And love is the root. And with this reading from Whispers from Eternity. May my spark commingle with thy great spark. May it twinkle in all eyes. Bless me that I may swim in the sea of souls. Let me rush with thee on avalanches of noble desire. Let me feel thee in the budding hopes of all roseate minds and in the silence of all saints. Let the tears of my sympathy commingle with the drops in all tearful eyes. Together, thou and I will dance on the wavelets of all feelings. We will cheer every heart with divine delight. Let us throb in the life of all beings. <laughs> 